In this session of the Purple Coffee Podcast, I speak to Steve Olsher about the very important importance of understanding your what. Hello and welcome to session 28 of the Purple Coffee Podcast, inspiring stories from creative entrepreneurs. I am your host, Turndog, and on this occasion I speak to the author and entrepreneur Steve Olsher, who shares his great mistake and how it's led him to today. Oh yes, this is an aid of my book, The Successful Mistake, which is a series of chapters about an entrepreneur's grandest faux pas and how they turned it around. And I have very good news for you because as some may know, I've begun the writing process and I'm inviting anyone who wishes to join me into the writing journey adventure and process. I share all, including sneak peek access and snippets and freebies and goodies along the way. So if you'd like exclusive access to The Successful Mistake and to see how a large non-fiction book like this is created, be sure to head on over to bit.ly forward slash purplecoffee28 and sign up. You'd be insane to not hand me your email so I can fulfill your world with gooey goodness each and every week. And after all, at the end of it, you're going to be getting free books. I mean, come on, what more do you want? Like, come on. But what about that interview? After all, that's why you are here, correct? You're interested to hear what Steve Olsher has to say, and he has wise words indeed. He shares how a few of his business ventures failed, the first of which during the dot-com crash, and the second in 2008 when the financial economy just, well, basically slipped from under his feet and his real estate side of things went down the plug hole. But it taught Steve to truly understand what was important in his life and it led him to write books about understanding your true what and the ultimate why. And this is something I personally am 100% on board with. Rather than chasing money and opportunities in that like, like he did for many years and it leading him to things he weren't overly passionate about, he now focuses on writing and working on projects that truly inspire him. He talks about people having a one true gift that you can't avoid even if you want to and it's all about just sharing that with the people that you can help the most and provide the most value to. There's some truly wise words in this so be sure to get some pen and paper out, make some notes. I left this interview completely and utterly head over heels inspired. It made me want to just run outside and do something crazy and important and I hope it has a similar effect on you. But before we get to that, you may be interested to know a bit more about this Steve Ulsher character. So I've created a couple notes on my iPhone in a way a storyteller like myself can. And I shall read it to you now in story form and an about me story about Steve himself. Okay, great. Well, here we go. Steve Olsher is America's reinvention expert and author of the book, What Is Your What? That's right, Steve reinvents people, opening them up with his metaphorical scalpel and twists and turns until he learns your true meaning. Performing life-changing operations each day, he helps people like you and me better understand being a who, the what, the why. Oh my, Steve may not have doctored to his name, although he should, but he's a master surgeon of the mind. Not a brain surgeon, mind you, do not under any circumstances let Steve operate on your physical brain thing. Anyways, he's cool as funk with lots of wisdom to share, so sit back, relax, and be ready to reinvent yourself, baby. Over to you, Steve, and past me. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and a big thank you to Steve Olsher for joining me. Steve is an author, um, of what is your what which basically is all about helping people find their true gift but i won't put words in steve's mouth because i'm sure he can tell us all about himself and what he is far better than i can so steve first of all thank you very much for joining me yeah man thanks for having me appreciate it absolute pleasure so yeah before we get going and start talking about your big mistake could you just tell us a little bit about who you are what it is you do etc 
So my, uh, my background is as an entrepreneur, started in the nightclub business when I was uh, very young, DJed and got in the music scene, um, went on to catalogs and dot coms and real estate and pretty much uh, anything that would pay a dollar or two, I'm sure I gave it a try at some point. And, uh, and for the last five years, <clears throat> my work has really been focused on helping people discover, share and monetize what it is that they are truly compelled to do. And, um, you know, if you had asked me five years ago, if this is the work that I would be doing now, I would have probably laughed you out of the room. But, uh, you know, it's just kind of funny how life works. And as you open yourself up to new ways of being, um, that just amazing things can happen. Absolutely. And one of the great things about um, working on the success of mistake and speaking to people like yourself is so many of the stories involve the journey from where they once were to where they are. And usually it's so unpredictable and you just can't imagine where it's going to take you. And you look back and think, how the hell am I here right now? It's crazy. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, like I say, this is an aid of the successful mistake, which is my book all about an entrepreneur's big mistake and how they turned it around. So we'll get straight into that. And I'm hoping you'll share a tale or two about one of your big mistakes, how it occurred and, you know, where it's led you since, really. So over to you on that one. Yeah, man. I mean, look, there's been no no shortage of mistakes. Um, and certainly uh, I've made some that are much bigger than others, um, you know, some with many zeros behind them. Uh, certainly one of the biggest mistakes that I made was in, um, in 1991. I started a catalog business uh, um, pretty much like Interflora. I think is what you have where you are, um, yeah, and right. except this was for wine and champagne and spirits and gift baskets. So basically, if you were in the UK and you wanted to send a bottle of champagne to someone in New York who just closed a big deal, um, you would work through us, and our New York retailer would deliver that that product. So, um, so that was called Liquor by Wire was the name of that company, and. Uh, uh, launched on CompuServe's Electronic Mall in 1993, launched on the internet in 1995, so very early in the space. Uh, and then in 1998, picked up the uh, domain liquor.com and <clears throat> really just had a pretty good thing going. I mean, we were doing uh, millions of dollars in sales and we had <clears throat> everything in place that you know we really needed to blow up into a pretty big business and at the time, um, you know, ideas on napkins were getting funded. That was sort of that first wave of, of dot-com hype. And, you know, we thought, look, here we are with a real company doing real sales. We got a great domain and we really just need marketing dollars, if you will, to get the word out. And then of course to support new personnel. And so, as we became blinded by the dot-com light and convinced that, you know, this is something that we should do in terms of pursuing additional dollars, uh, we started raising money and that money eventually led towards uh, our wanting to go public because obviously that was the exit the, that the investors saw. And we were convinced wholeheartedly, you know, hook, line and sinker by our investment bankers that in order to get to that promised land uh, that Wall Street would want to see more seasoned executives at the helm. And so basically they wanted to see, you know, the gray hairs, right? And the CEOs and the CFOs and all those lettered people. And I mean, just looking at what the potential was on paper, said, okay, you know, maybe this is something that uh, that we should do. And so literally signed away my management rights to the company. And within um, about three months or so, when the paperwork was done, uh, the timing was right around March of 2000, which is when everything imploded. And so when we couldn't get out, we couldn't get public, it became very clear that you know, these saviors that we had brought in really had no clue how to run a business and certainly had no clue how to run, you know, my business, right? And so, uh, but my hands were tied. And literally within uh, the next nine months, I walked away from everything, 
you know, the 10 years that I had into it without anything to show and, you know, walked away from the domain and the whole nine. And, you know, in hindsight, uh, that was, that was a huge mistake. I mean, really no one can run your business the way that you can. No one understands your business the way that you do. And to sign away one's management rights for all of the wrong reasons will inevitably net you the result that we realized. Wow. I mean, that must have been so hard because this isn't a company that had just boomed overnight. You know, you'd been going for sort of seven or eight years at this point, and it really must have been your baby. So to just sign it over, it must have been a horrendous decision to make. It, um, you know, I think that the, the decision was easy at the time in terms of signing over the management rights. The, the reality was hard, right? The reality that everything that had gone into this business with, over that decade, uh, you know, would fall by the wayside. And it was, um, it, it hurt my pride more than it hurt my pocketbook because, you know, as an entrepreneur, I didn't have the money anyway. You know, it's not like I was getting all of this money, right? Everything that I made was going back into the business. So it's not like I was living high off, you know, just high off the land there, you know, with, with fat rise and this, that, and the other. It just wasn't my lifestyle. It still isn't my lifestyle. So everything that I was making was going back into the business. So on paper, right, the idea of having all this money was great, but I never really had it, right? So to go from the point of working and not having a lot of money to not working and not having a lot of money, you know, from a lifestyle change, it really it didn't affect things uh, in any great way, but it, it really knocked the pride, knocked my ego pretty good. I mean, you say it's an easy decision. Was it Was it the money that made it an easy decision? Or was it... And, yep. Yeah, because obviously you were saying there, money's not so much of a big deal. Was it the idea of we could have one of the best businesses on the web? And was it kind of maybe the ego and the pride thing as well that led? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely, for sure. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't, you know, it's, it wasn't my intentions to be broke forever. And I'm not saying that I was, you know, broke, but at the same token, you know, it wasn't, uh, we weren't living off of yachts and having mansions in the sky, right? So it was just, um, you know, it was the reality of wanting to build uh, a significant business and establishing a strong presence online because we had one of the best um, assets that you could have to be in the business that we were in for sure. Mm, it must have just been a very tough time <clears throat> for anyone in that domain during that time because obviously the the bust was a rather epic one so it must have been tough just in general but then to be walking away from a company you spent years building uh, must have added an extra pinch of salt to it. Yeah you know man and um you know, there are people who say that everything happens for a reason and, you know, this, that and the other. But, you know, I would have been happy to have been a billionaire for a reason. So, you know, I, that, that would have been OK, too. Yeah, that's very true. Wouldn't turn it down. So where did it take you since? Um, because you must have been in a pretty tough position there. But like you say, you're, you're an entrepreneur by heart and it wasn't necessarily the money that drove you. I'm sure you were keen to, to get back into the swing of things. Did it kind of knock your confidence and your ability to pick and choose what you were doing moving forward, or did it help in that aspect? So, I mean, yeah, it was, I mean, it was certainly hard, and I didn't have the luxury of really sitting still. And I remember literally when I walked away from everything, I remember coming home and just sitting on the front steps of my house um, and just not wanting to yet go inside because I knew that I would have to face the realities of seeing my family. And, you know, we had a, a couple of kids at that point and my wife wasn't working. So, um, so that was scary. Right. And, um, and she was very understanding, but knew that I had to do something. And so after the dot com boom, um, there was the real estate boom. Right. And so a lot of people were, taking houses and flipping them and making money or buying buildings and turning them into condominiums and making money that way. 
And I remember I was in the gas station and I had overheard a conversation with um, a couple of um, taxi drivers. And one of the taxi drivers said to the other, basically, I had just made $50,000 on buying this house and flipping it. And I, th- you know, I thought to myself, you know, look, I mean, if, if not to, you know, knock on taxi drivers, but I'm just sitting there thinking like, you know, if these guys can do it, then, you know, it's certainly something that I can do. And, um, and so I, I jumped pretty heavily into the space uh, pretty quickly and put together a plan, found a building, raised some money, and ended up uh, completing my first project about eight months later. Fantastic. And how long did you stay into that side of things? Was it just a one-time thing, or did you make that into a bit of a sort of journey too? Yeah, no, I ended up staying in the real estate business for over 12 years. Wow. So and, you, went uh, through, you went through another bust then. Um, obviously, four or five years ago, tough in itself. Yeah, and, you know, same sort of thing. I mean, on paper, uh, there was a point in time where I had nine figures worth of wealth. Um, and uh, when the real estate market started to crumble, you know, then um, then a lot of that wealth went by the wayside with it. So, yeah, you know, it's uh, it timing is everything, man, no doubt. Oh, absolutely. Did you approach things a little differently with the real estate compared to the, the dot com? Because obviously, very different things, but in essence, um, share quite a few similarities. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, business is business for the most part, right? And so um, what what I know is that when you're in the widget business, it really doesn't matter what widget you're selling. You're still selling a widget. And so, obviously, there are similarities between the different markets. Um, the The industry that I'm in now has nothing to do with widgets, and it's all about people first and money second. And interestingly enough, when you put your work first and you put people first, um, you have the ability to to really um, achieve both peace and prosperity. And so the two do not have to be mutually exclusive. That's, really, that's a really good point because it sounds like that was one of your main aims all along. You were entrepreneur by heart with the website of things, but it wasn't all about the money. It was about building something important. It sounds like it was a similar experience with the housing market. When you, when you got out of that and you thought, I've been in two crashes here, I've seen the highs, I've seen the lows, were you just really keen to get in something that wouldn't necessarily experience them waves, but just give you more of a plateau of sort of, like you say, peace and prosperity, really? So I didn't really have a choice. Um, and, and I say that because it was about five years ago now where I had that, that turning point. And I had known for years that um, I really didn't want to continue with real estate. Um, because the um, the lack of integrity that the people that I was working with demonstrated on a daily basis was frightening, right? And so um, I don't know if you ever dealt in any sort of construction or real estate or anything of that nature, but you know when you're dealing with contractors, um, I mean these guys are there. There's a place in hell for them. I mean there's no there's no doubt about that. So, uh, so I had known for years that I just, I couldn't continue to do what I was doing. And so about five years ago now, I had um, sort of that fork in the road for me, that yay no moment as I now call it. Um, basically, I was with my stepfather, who was very much a father to me, raised me since I was 10. And... I was with him bedside as he was unfortunately in his final days of life. Um, and as I held his hand in his final hours, I had a vision, um, not of his funeral, but actually of mine. And I could hear the words being spoken graveside, which were basically, here lies Steve Olsher. He dedicated his life to chasing the almighty dollar. And that's all that was said. Right. And it, and it hit me really hard because, you know, he was pretty much showing me my inevitable fate unless I changed course. And he knew that I had always wanted to, you know, sort of do something extraordinary, but 
you know, I just always had like that nagging kind of tucking in my collar type feeling that that's what I was meant and made to do, but I, I didn't know how to make that happen. And so I knew that something had to change. And I used that as the impetus of the spark to say, you know, I really need to reinvent and re, you know, examine my life and where I'm at and what I'm doing. Um, and that's when I started putting pen to paper just because I thought I had some tips and tools and strategies and shortcuts uh, that I could offer to others in an attempt to really flatten their learning curve. Uh, and that's when I started opening myself up to all of these ideas, I think, that just sort of float around the universe, if you will, waiting for the right um, receptor to bring those ideas and thoughts to fruition. And I think I was just um, in that moment in the right place at the right time. And I totally emphasize with that because writing for me is a huge therapy as well. It's amazing what it, what kind of clarity it can offer you once you put pen to paper or fingers to the keyboard. And I suppose the big problem with your mistake back in the late 90s was you had this thing and you lost ownership of it. But now you're in a world where I, I guess you feel like you have complete ownership. You, you take charge on pretty much everything that you do. It's in your hands. Yeah. And... What I will say is that, and I don't know if you experience the same issues or phenomena when you're when you're writing, but you know, like I, I'm just not egotistical enough to take credit for my creations. You know, I don't I don't know where all of this stuff comes from, but you know, I know that once I start writing, it really does flow, um, and. It's uh, it's incredible what happens when you allow yourself to to be in that moment of, of reception and to allow that to flow. And, um, you know, it's it's a really interesting process, I think, that few will ever experience because they just simply chase the widget. They chase the opportunity uh, as opposed to allowing themselves to create that opportunity. And there's a huge delineation between the two frames of mind. Oh, I totally understand what you mean. People quite often ask me how I come up with my ideas and whatnot. And I just say, I have no idea. I'm just open to the worlds that are around me. And sometimes you just have to sit quietly and observe. And like yeah. you say, it's not necessarily creating anything as such. It's just observation and then putting a few connective the dots here and there. And before you know it, you've got this whole new thing and you're just writing and writing and writing. And it's amazing. Sure. Amazing that sure. journey it takes you down. Yep. And I love how you keep saying you're chasing the widget because I, I guess there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there, especially in the early days, who they think, I've got to have that idea, I've got to have that thing. And they might want to build a brand so they can one day sell it or they want to maybe build it and grow it and grow it and grow it. But whenever there's that kind of widget in front of you, be it money or whatever, you're always going to be chasing this never ending sort of shadow you'll never be able to reach it. But once you kind of sit back and enjoy the the idea of having peace and tranquility and just helping people, then you're not really trying to achieve anything per se, you're just having a great time. And, you know, you will make money and you will form connections. Yeah, I, um, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to, have you, have you had a chance to go through this at all? I've not, no, but I've, um, I'm but... going to certainly add it to the reading list. It sounds so, like an ideal um, read. so basically, the um, so the way that it's structured is so there's there's a formula here which basically involves three pieces. So it's the gifts, the vehicle, and the people. I mean, those are the three those are the three elements of the what is your what equation. And what I believe is that you know your what really is that which has chosen you, and it's not that which you have chosen. And so you know your gifts are they're ingrained in your dna really a part of your blueprint i mean you could fight it you can deny it but you know that's pretty much an effort in futility but the the fact is that you were given a certain set of of, of wiring if you will that in that it really empowers you to excel in very specific ways and once you're clear then on what those gifts are, the question is then how will you share those gifts with the world, which is the vehicle, and then who are you most compelled to serve, which are the people? Mm. And when you are clear on the answer to those three questions, you 
pretty much will always avoid the widget and chasing commodity oriented opportunities because then it's really more about leveraging your gifts to serve as opposed to having the people serve you, which is what so many entrepreneurs think about. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. And I suppose you, uh, you know, the perfect example there, it sounds like for 15 years or so, you were, you know, fighting the gift, which has led you to now. And once you started piecing it all together, you know, bit by bit, it, you know, it's led you to here. And it sounds like I can imagine that book, has been created off you know years of actual experience of living lives going you know i think i'm happy but am i actually happy you know in um in author land it's often said that we write the book that we most need and <laughs> so you know it's uh it, it's definitely a reflection of where, where i was uh and certainly where i continue to be i mean it's a struggle for me on a daily basis to stay clear on why I'm here and who I truly am compelled to serve and then create products and services that support that journey. Oh, and I totally agree with that because the successful mistake very much came about of my own fear of mistakes and wanting to tackle them head on. So yeah, it is very apt indeed. Well, we're nearly finishing up here. It's been such an amazing insight. And I think the journey you've taken over the years is fantastic. You've seen the highs and you've seen the lows in a few different industries. And it's led you to something where, at least from the outside looking in, you seem very content, very happy. And I can imagine you're going to have a very fulfilled life from here on in, which is great to see. So if you could send out a, a quick piece of advice to a, a new or young entrepreneur out there who's maybe looking into getting their first business, maybe they own their own business and there's going to be outside pressures of people trying to take it away, set up a board of directors or whatever. What, what advice would you give to that person? So how much time do we have, right? Um, <laughs> Just keep so, it down to one or two quick nuggets. <laughs> right. So um, so there's a few things. The first one won't be original at all, um, which is, you know, trust your gut, trust your instinct. You know, your first answer is almost always right. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard that about, a, you know, 30 million times today. Um, but the, you know, the other elements, um, sort of advice, if you will, that I will, that I will offer are twofold. Number one, you know, I strongly believe that when you look back on your life, you'll most regret failing to act than taking action and realizing what those weak-minded people term as failure, right? Because in reality, failure doesn't exist. I choose to view failure as success with an unintended ending, right? I mean, simply because you try like to put it. some, you know, try to put something to pass doesn't mean that, uh, you know, if it doesn't go to plan, it doesn't mean you're a failure. It just simply means that uh, you know, it just didn't go as good as you hope, but it probably didn't go as poorly as you feared either. And so, um, you know, fear is another one, right? I mean, it's you got to just uh, sort of embrace the fear. And for me, my my acronym for fear is forget everything about reality, because that's often what happens is we just become handcuffed by what we think is going to happen. You know, it's sort of that whole mind fucking thing, right? You know, we just we create this vision of where we think things are going to go and seldom will it go in that direction. It may come close. It may not even come close, but it's never going to be exactly as you imagined. And lastly, what I will offer to you is what one of my very early mentors offered to me, which is when I was 19 years of age, I was thinking about opening up a nightclub. And I had been DJing for a number of years and I had a pretty good following, but I had never opened a nightclub before. Uh, and so I was thinking about it and I was concerned, obviously, with all the things that any young entrepreneur is, you know, is, is concerned with, you know, looking bad, losing money, not being able to recover, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I was talking to him about the idea. I said, you know, this is what I'm thinking. Um, what do you, you know, what do you think? And he said, well, remind me what you're doing now. And I told him, I said, you know, well, I'm, I'm DJing, I'm, I'm waiting tables, I'm, I'm pumping gas. You know, I'm doing pretty much whatever I do to make ends meet. And he thought about it for about three seconds. And then he looked me in my eyes and he said, you know, Steve, if things don't work out with the club, you can always go back to pumping gas. And, you know, I guess that's the, the takeaway, man, is you can always go back to pumping gas, right? There's something that you know how to do. And when push comes to shove, if you got to put food on the table, there's something you can do. It's true. And, and like you say, it's it's better to look back 
and have acted and maybe got things wrong rather than wonder, oh man, what if I'd done this? You're just going to live life, you know, wondering that big what if, which, yeah, you know, my first novel was all about ultimately that, that idea of what if it's a haunting thing. Yeah, it's exactly right. I mean, you can either embrace what you were, what is and share that with strategic abandon as best you can or really lay on your deathbed knowing that you squandered the greatest gift you were given. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I've absolutely loved this conversation. What an inspiring journey it's been. It really has. Everyone listening slash watching, you should check out Steve's book, What Is Your What? I'm going to be putting the links and whatnot on this page. And it's just been an absolute honor. So, Steve, thank you very, very much. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me on. No, cheers. Okay, there you have it, ladies and gents. Another session of the Purple Coffee podcast at an end. And a big thanks to you for joining us. And a huge thanks to Steve for sharing his great mistake. I hope you will join me on the Successful Mistake Adventure. I've interviewed over 150 inspiring minds. And it's now my duty to create a book based around it all. And I'm sharing the full ins and outs with you if you wish. So head over to bit.ly forward slash purple coffee 28. Sign up to the Successful Mistake mailing list and I will send you weekly updates full of exclusive goodiness, goodies, freebies, sneak peek access, deleted snippets, and pretty much anything else that you ask for. I'm going to include you in the complete process, including what the cover should look like, the blurb, the book launch, everything, everything, everything. So I hope you will join me. But wow, what an inspiring discussion with Steve. Seriously, I walked away from this one full of vigor and just wanting to get to work. It just goes to show that although you can chase money for a certain amount of time, eventually your mind grows tired. And after a couple of big failures where you are just left down, rock bottom, hurting because it's just been ripped from you, Eventually you start asking the big questions like, what is important to me? And I'm so glad Steve discovered this because he's written a couple of some fantastic books on it. He creates great content on his website. And yeah, he's just able to thrive and help other people thrive and reinvent themselves. So if you're wanting to do that in a nine to five job, your business as a solopreneur, whatever, this kind of approach is going to help people and I'm hoping it's helped you too. So be sure to check out Steve and his world. I'll provide all his links to his Twitter and whatnot below this video and the audio bit. And you can check that out over at bit.ly forward slash purple coffee 28. Whilst there, you can also subscribe to this very podcast. So be sure to do so. If you like to listen, it's the iTunes you're after. And if you like to watch, it's the Vimeo. And if you would like exclusive content coming into your inbox before everybody else, then it's the mailing list that you should be signing up to. But please, please, if you enjoyed this show, subscribe to one of them. And if you um, subscribe to iTunes, leave a review. It's a rather lonely place. And I'd love to start getting some reviews there. It'd make me feel all jiggly, even if it is like a one or two star you that cruel? Maybe you are, but I'd rather have it than nothing at all. And finally, make sure you share it among your loved ones. That's why the tweet and Facebook buttons are there. Don't let a conversation like this go to waste. Share it with everyone you know, and hopefully it will help them in a way that it's helped you and me. I know Steve's words are fine indeed. I'm sure you agree, and it's a pleasure having you. So until next time, keep it cool, keep it awesome, keep it on the lowdown. I don't even know what that means. <laughs>